Uh, we're going to talk about the impact of a sale of a business on employees. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky area. It's an area that is um, changing. And uh, so we've got some recent case law that we'll talk about. And uh, we'll talk about some basics of how the uh, regimes work. So um, successorship um, is, is the concept that you'll hear often. Um, people often call it the successor, successor employer provisions of the uh, Employment Standards Act. And the circumstances that trigger successorship rights for employees varies depending upon the type of transfer we're talking about and the type of regime that we happen to be falling under, whether it's the common law, the Employment Standards Act, or in the collective bargaining uh, scenarios. So um, let's start with the first, uh, share sales. So share sales are relatively straightforward in that uh, in the case of a share sale, uh, the legal employer does not change. So uh, the shares of the uh, corporate entity are purchased, but the corporate entity remains the same, which means that the employment contracts that the corporation has with the respective employees continues to exist. So there's no termination of the employment contract nor uh, any of the collective agreement uh, rights that might exist. So when you are a purchaser of a share uh, in a share transaction, um, you need to be a little bit more uh, attuned to what you want this to look like at the end of the day. And if there are certain employees um, that you would like to terminate, um, you've got to make sure that that's part of the original transaction and that the vendor of the, sale of the shares um, makes those uh, uh, terminations uh, prior to and as part of the closing. So um, it's, a, it's a relatively straightforward uh, sort of a scenario in, in a share sale. The more complicated scenario is when you have an asset sale. So in an asset sale, each of the various uh, assets are sold individually um, and there's most often a new entity who is the purchaser. Sometimes different entities are, are the purchasers. So um, uh, there can be uh, in these scenarios a, a situation where most often the legal employer doesn't continue and so uh, we have to look at what happens in the various regimes after that. Um, quick note that sometimes these transfers are not voluntary. Uh, sometimes they are uh, enacted at the behest of a creditor um, and so often the receiver is appointed and the uh, assets are sold by the receiver. So um, let's look at each of the uh, regimes to, to sort of see how that works. So uh, the starting point for common law uh, was back in 1940 and uh, in the, the Noakes decision back then we had uh, a position taken at common law that a contract of employment could not be assigned. So um, this sort of has its roots in uh, avoiding hints of slavery but um, essentially, uh, it made sure that employers could not transfer employees from one to the other. Um, this results in a constructive dismissal of the employee and triggers uh, rights to uh, notice of pay or, uh, sorry, to notice or pay in lieu of that notice. Um, so if um, an employee elects to accept employment with a new employer, there was no recognition of past service uh, with previous employer and it sort of has a harsh outcome on the employee. So recently, uh, the case law has tempered a lot of that, and a lot of the cases you see will be looking for or, or essentially producing exceptions to that original common law position. So one of the exceptions is where there is an express recognition of past service by the purchaser, typically by way of a new employment contract with the employees, and it will have an express provision in it that acknowledges the past service with the previous employer and, and off you go. Um, so these are this is based on the concept of innovation and effectively you have a new three-party agreement where everyone agrees to substitute the new contract for the old contract. And purchasers are often wanting this sort of a scenario and are prepared to assume the obligations that are associated with doing this um, because in exchange, they're getting very experienced, trained staff on day one. So this is uh, something that you know ha happens frequently, um, and that's that's good news for all. Um, sometimes there's no recognition, and that's when we get into trouble. So 
In the second scenario, we've got implied recognition of service. And what the courts have been doing, you know, starting back with the Court of Appeal in 1986 in Addison and Loeb, and most recently in two decisions, one, one from this year, um, the courts will imply in a provision that there is a recognition of service, past service, by the new purchaser. Um, this is uh, um, typically in a scenario where we have a going concern business. So, you know, the old employment looks a lot like the new employment and it, it, there's a, you know, a very smooth transition. And in those cases, the courts say, listen, Mr. Purchaser, sorry, you're going to be responsible for all of the years of service that that employee had with, with, the, with the vendor. So um, that has helped sort of, you know, level the playing field. Um, what complicates things a little bit is the Employment Standards Act. So in the case of an Employment Standards Act uh, scenario, and the provision is, is set out here, Section 9 of the EFA, um, this is what uh, is sort of colloquially called the successor employer provision. But essentially what the section does is it deems uh, the employment to continue and it deems the past service to be relevant uh, for the purposes of calculating the employee's length of service or for their period of employment. So that is, um, you know, a remedial section from the remedial uh, legislation, and it's designed to protect employees so they are not prejudiced um, in scenarios where there is a purchase and sale, um, typically where there's a non-going concern scenario. Um, so. Um, that's what the section says. Um, applying it, um, there's been a whole bunch of case law about this uh, application of this section, but essentially sale, sales and sale um, were, are going to include a very broad list of uh, types of transactions. So leases, transfers, dispositions, contracting out, all of those sorts of things are going to be considered a sale typically under the provision. Um, uh, it also doesn't, necessarily require the sale to be a going concern sale. So it will capture those scenarios where we have creditors stepping in or where the assets are sold off in a piecemeal fashion. So um, what do you do with a scenario where there's notice given to an employee about the pending sale? So, you know, a vendor says to its employees uh, prior to the sale transaction, listen, I'm going to be selling you're, you know, next next month, next week, whatever, uh, we're going to have a sale and, and your employment's going to transfer. Um, if the purchasing company rehires the employee, that notice is uh, completely irrelevant for the purposes of calculating statutory notice entitlements of the employee later when there's an ultimate termination. And that's the, the small and equitable management case. However, in the cases where uh, an employee isn't doesn't accept the reemployment, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have a, a common law calculation that needs to be done. In that sort of a scenario, the notice that the employee received about the ap approaching closing is going to be relevant and is going to be something that we include in the calculation for the notice period that the employee has received. So um, it's good practice if you are completing a sale to give the employees notice of the pending sale and that notice will count to your credit in this narrow circumstance, but it's one that employers are going to care about. So um, it's a good practice to, to entertain. Um, where an employee accepts reemployment, um, they are not entitled to the ESA pay at the time of the sale. So they don't get the cash at the time. Um, <clears throat> it counts to their credit and it counts to their credit. Ultimately, if there is a sale down the, a termination down the road, um, but it is not something that the employee can insist, on, can insist on at the time of the sale. If an employer, for whatever reason, pays it, um, they are going to, uh, to be a little bit out of luck because there are no set-off provisions in the ESA that will entitle them to sort of get that back later. So they do risk double paying if they do make that payment. So you want to be careful about that. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Employment Standards Act also does not require a new employer to offer reemployment on the same terms. So they may have been a full-time employee prior to the, to the sale. After the sale, they may move to part-time. 
And in that scenario, the ESA is still going to count, uh, the Section 9 is still going to apply, and the continuous service is still going to, to carry through. So the past years of service are still going to count no matter what. And that's from uh, the uh, Christian Murthy case, uh, which is a very recent Court of Appeal case, which is interesting not only for that proposition, but for a, a few others. So I'm just going to walk through the case uh, with you quickly. Um, <clears throat> the case involved uh, uh, the defendant Olympus, who was in the optical science business, and they had a distributor by the name of Carson. Mr. K, which is easier to say than his actual name, uh, is going was working for Carson and began working in 2000. Um, in 2005, Olympus uh, elected to terminate the distribution agreement with Carson and decided to open their own distribution company. So uh, they purchased some, but not all, of the assets of Carson, and they offered uh, employment to 122 out of the 125 Carson employees, including Mr. K. Um, at the time of the uh, transfer, uh, they asked each of the employees to sign a written employment agreement which provided for essentially the same terms of employment that they had had previously, except, and these are two fairly big exceptions, uh, it contained a termination clause which provided for a particular notice uh, obligation, um, uh, ESA or, or four weeks per year up to a maximum of 10. Um, and it also expressly indicated that Mr. K was going to be a new employee and that he would release uh, Olympus in, in the event of any termination claims relating to uh, Carson. Uh, a lot of the employees received signing bonuses. Uh, Mr. K did not. Um, and so uh, ultimately, we all know how this story is going to go. In 2015, Mr. K was terminated and uh, Olympus offered payments to him as per the 2005 agreement that he had signed. Uh, Mr. K did not like that and he sued. Uh, for wrongful dismissal. Um, the trial court held that the 2005 agreement was unenforceable and they based that on the fact that uh, Olympus had not provided consideration for the signing of the new contract. Um, and they relied effectively on the fact that Mr. K had not received a signing bonus as compared to a bunch of the other employees who had. And the court said, listen, you can't just offer him a job. That's not good consideration. There needs to be something additional added in exchange for the signing of the contract. And because he didn't get a signing bonus, the contract is unenforceable. Um, the Court of Appeal didn't like that, and they overturned the trial judge's decision. Um, they determined that uh, the uh, 2005 agreement was, in fact, enforceable. And uh, a few interesting things came out of the Court of, of Appeals decision. Um, the court confirmed that what we thought we all knew is that a promise to perform an existing contract is not valid consideration, which is essentially what the trial judge had said, except that the court here said that the trial judge made an error because that's only in scenarios where the employer is the same. Here, we have two very different employers. We have old employer, uh, Carson and we have new employer Olympus and so the court said that is good valid consideration that is a new employment contract for Mr. K and it is in fact sufficient consideration for the contract that they asked him to sign so the uh, signing bonus aspects the court held were not relevant and so the contract was deemed to be binding on Mr. K um, Mr. K tried to rely on Section 9.1 of the Employment Standards Act to say, wait a minute, my employment is a continuous employment pursuant to the successor employer provisions. And uh, the court held that that unfortunately doesn't assist Mr. K. Um, Section 9, uh, the Court of Appeal said, um, and the ESA generally, are relevant for determining continuity of employment for purposes relevant to the Employment Standards Act. So, any of one's entitlements under the Employment Standards Act as an employee, that is something that you can look to Section 9 for. But Section 9 is not something that employees can look for for all purposes. And so the court held that, listen, this is um, a non-Employment Standards Act consideration. This is whether or not they, he signed a new contract at law. And that is not something that Section 9.1 of the ESA is going to assist you with. 
And so, um, you know, I think that's something that the uh, subsequent case law and the subsequent practitioners are going to pick up on a lot. And you're going to see a lot of restrictions of the application of Section 9 uh, now to uh, scenarios that are specifically and exclusively Employment Standards Act entitlement issues. So um, it's an interesting case. We'll, we'll see what happens with it uh, down the road. Um, switching gears a little bit, we're just going to turn to a couple of other nuts and bolts kind of things. Um, so vacation pay uh, in, a, in a business sale transaction scenario. If you have an unpaid vacation pay uh, scenario with employees, those are considered to be unpaid wages. Uh, so they will form uh, a lien and a charge against the property of the obligor, the successor, and um, it will be something that falls on the successor to pay, ultimately. Um, if uh, the employee is rehired by the successor, um, the, the lien isn't enforceable immediately, similar to you know, entitlements under the ESA for, for uh, pay. Uh, it's something that happens once there's a termination or once the, the vacation pay entitlement kicks in and it's to be taken. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. If the employee is not rehired, then we're into the ordinary scenario and they will be entitled to their vacation pay as well as their ESA entitlements, et cetera. So um, that's how that works. Um, in the scenario of a collective ag agreement and a unionized scenario, uh, we're talking about a sale of a unionized business under the uh, Ontario Labor Relations Act in Section 69. And uh, Section 69 sub 2 of the Act provides that a person to whom a business is sold is bound by the collective agreement. So um, in the event of a sale, any collective agreement rights that existed before, those continue on after the sale, which uh, you know makes sense. Um, the, the Act does sort of define and set out what's involved and what, how uh, both uh, cells and businesses are, are defined, and those are set out here on the slide, and it's a relatively straightforward scenario. So um, given my time constraints, I'm not going to go any farther into that, but uh, um, that's uh, the provisions and, and contemplations you should to keep in mind when you're selling a business. So thank you for your time.